This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Today we're going to cover the book, Extreme Ownership. How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And this is the first time we've had three people to discuss together on this podcast. Eric, can you go ahead and introduce our special guest for us? Yeah, so today we have Mike Schiavone. Did I say that right? That's close enough. I, I say it's Siobhan, but if we were in Italy, I think you would have had it right. No, no, no. He wouldn't have had it right because no, 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 then he would have no, had no, to have no. the music with it. It would have been yeah. Schiavone. Right? Schiavone. Right? Schiavone. That's you know. more accurate, yes. Right. right. It's uh, it's the, um, you know, buongiorno. You got to have that. Or, or uh, Dominic de Coco. Gorlami. That's exactly it. <laughs> so Mike uh, Mike has had me on his podcast, the the good the good network podcast uh, a few times once, once uh, last year and then another time this year. And, and they're doing some great stuff over there. So I'm, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mike and let him tell us a little more, m- bit more about himself, what he's doing right now, what, uh, where he is, and then uh, some more about his podcast. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. This is the first time I've been on somebody else's podcast. So it's, it's a, it's cool to be on the other side of the mic, so to speak. Uh, on the other side of the interview, but so I work full time as an athletic trainer at Colorado State University. I work with the men's basketball team primarily, and then um, I so in doing that, I've been around the country at a few other spots. I worked football at Army West Point for two years from 2015 to 2017. It's a place that really impacted me. It's a place that. Um, you know that that culture and that mentality of the of the cadet athlete impacted me a lot. Uh, it's, I was at West Point when I first read extreme ownership. So there's a lot of correlation between what I was reading and the people I was interacting with. Uh, prior to that, I worked at the university of Florida. I also got my master's degree there. We all have things we're, we're ashamed of in our past, man. (laughs) It's 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 okay. Get it out. (laughs) Um, and, and, you know, that was when I really got into high level athletics and and what it takes to do the job at a high level and, and high what it level takes for to... Florida. <laughs> if, if you say so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, so I work in collegiate athletics. It's what I've been doing for the last six or seven years. And so uh, I love it. In addition to that, me and two of my best friends make the, make a podcast called the good network. Uh, basically it started, it started from the book, extreme ownership, me and Mike D Fran, he recommended the book to me in 2015 and we started talking a lot about the book over the phone, listening to a lot of podcasts. Jocko started making a podcast. We were listening to that. We were talking about the, about the book and about his podcast. And we said, you know, what if we recorded one of these conversations? And so that's what we did. And, and in 2016, we were kind of putzing around making this podcast that we called good, the podcast for those that do. And it, it was very, uh, it was, it was very amateurish. We, we really didn't know what we were doing. We really were trying our hardest, but you know, it didn't really stick. We brought in another, one of our best friends from growing up, Tom Cristino to help add some life to it. And he's a big social media guy. He works in public relations. So he kind of took over that aspect of it. And from there, it's grown a lot. We kind of rebranded it to the good network. And now we're what we focus on doing is, is sharing the good stories that people that are normal people do to impact the people around them. And so we've had on a ton of different people. We've had Eric on twice. Um, we've had on a, a pretty good amount of veterans to talk about what they've done post military. Um, and those are stories I really like to share. You know, it's, it's a, 
that's a segment and a population that that really strikes a chord with me and i like having them on i like hearing um you know the one percent that has served our country and what they're doing now to help continue to serve um even though they don't put a uniform in it on every day and and that's what we do on the side it's been really cool. We've had a lot of really great conversations and we're really working towards building a brand and building a platform to just help make an impact in whatever population it is that you feel is important. So that's kind of the good network in a nutshell. It's awesome. Appreciate it's it. Awesome. Well, it's, it's cool to hear too that, uh, that the book we're going to talk about today was, was the Genesis part of, part of the part of the genesis for for the podcast so yeah it really was uh, i'm really looking forward to uh to hearing more of your thoughts about the book uh so uh mike all the books that we we read and discuss on this podcast are those that are suggested in the tools of or the uh tim ferris show podcast and so extreme ownership was one of those books and it's been discussed on five different episodes of the Tim Show, Tim Ferriss Show podcast. Most of those are in relation to when Tim actually had Jocko on the podcast. And that, right. from what I understand, was a, a, a really important episode because Tim encouraged Jocko to to start a podcast. And that was the first time that um, that he had been uh, challenged with that, I guess. And, and one of the main reasons that that Jocko did start his podcast. So. He's referred back to it a lot on, on different episodes, uh, so five in total. But um, I think the the main one where this book was was discussed was in the the episode where where Tim interviews Jocko, and we'll we'll definitely have that in the the show notes. And further to that, I asked five I asked for five suggestions from books from uh, the Instagram following for Books of Titans, and this was one of them that came up. So this was this was recommended to me by Julio Armend Armendariz. And we will, I will connect. I'll, yeah, I butchered that. Armendar is, uh, yeah, so uh, we'll, I'm going to connect to him uh, in the show notes as well. But uh, thank you, Julio, for the, for the recommendation there. And so that's, that's the reason I picked up the book. So about the, the authors, Jocko and Leif are, are uh, Navy, or they were Navy SEALs. Uh, they're, they're both most famous for their work in Ramadi and with SEAL Team Number Three, in especially the Battle of Ramadi. If you guys are familiar with uh, uh, the the movie American Sniper about Chris Kyle, Chris Kyle was also part of SEAL Team Three, and he actually uh, shows up in this book. Uh, they discuss some work uh, with him. And so that that's interesting. And, and just the, the tie in there with, uh, with popular culture, but, uh, but yeah, as Mike mentioned, Jocko has his own podcast and, uh, interestingly enough, Jocko released a new book today called the way of the warrior kid Mark's mission. So that's, uh, it's a second book geared more towards kids and, and helping them, uh, I guess address bullying and, and, have a good sense of, of who they are. And, and, um, and so that, yeah, his second one released today, you know, so. you've, you know, you've reached the, you've reached it. You've, you've, you've arrived as a popular level author when you're starting to put out the, uh, the books, the book versions for the kids. That's yep. when, you know, that's, that's a marker. <laughs> so I'm just for any of us or for anybody out there, if somebody comes to you and says, yeah, you know, your last book went really well, can we do a kid's version? You will know you have reached the mountaintop at that point. Yep. <laughs> yep. So a few other things about the authors. They also work together now uh, as business consultants for a company called Echelon Front. So it's it's Jocko and Leif who, who are the, the two consultants for that company. And Jocko in Ramadi was the lieutenant commander. So he, he was pretty high up uh, and... Yeah, the, the podcast, if you get a chance to listen to his podcast, it, it, it goes to some dark places. Uh, I've, I've had to forward, fast forward some of them, just the the details he gets into with, yeah, with you've got massacres. And I do have a weak stomach, but uh, like, for instance, he, he did, uh, Mike, actually, uh, after we spoke, I, I listened to Jocko's podcast where he he discussed the um, Victor Frankel book, Man's Search oh, yeah. for Meaning. 
and he didn't think he didn't think Victor went into enough detail about how how horrible the con- concentration camps were. So he uh, he he found some some uh, some stories and, and started out the podcast with that. So sounds like Jocko. Yeah, kind of what he does. So I've got some good quotes from Jocko that weren't even necessarily in the book that I want to cover later on. But uh, before that, Mike, do you want to just introduce the uh, the book and kind of how it's set up, the layout of it, and 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 then we can go from there. Yeah. So the way this book is really laid out, it's the laws of combat. I, I believe it's thirteen laws of combat that that Jocko and Leif kind of put together first through their consulting company, Echelon Front. And they were having clients saying, you know, can you write this down for us? Can you write this down for us? Can you write this down for us? And eventually they put it to paper and it became extreme ownership. And so each section is a law of combat or each chapter is a law of combat. And then within each chapter, it's broken down into three parts, mostly it begins with a story from combat that they experienced in Iraq, and then it goes into the principle of it, and then it breaks it down into a business application that can be a little bit more applicable to the everyday person, you know, someone that hasn't been to war, someone that hasn't seen, you know, real combat. Mm-hmm. So it, it uh, being to explain these concepts that began as, as laws of combat. And now they can really just be a law of life almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed the, the setup of it. Um, it actually reminded me of a, of a few different books and in a way it reminded me of man's search for meaning in, in this sense where there, there are situations that some people go through that, that are so intense that it, it brings out the, the the widest range of of emotions of of actions and this this was like that book as was man's search for meaning so man's search for meaning victor frankl's in the concentration camps he's seeing the worst of what people can do to each other he's also seeing amazing things that people are able to do to make it through that and and similar with this book there there there's extreme uh situations going on uh one one of the quotes at the very beginning of the book is a combat leader can acquire a lifetime of leadership lessons learned in only a few deployments. So the amount of stress and decisions they're making decisions that are affecting people live or die. Uh, that's where these, these, uh, these laws of combat come from. And, and I kept thinking of them as principles and especially after reading Ray Dalio's book principles earlier this year, it had a, it had a kind of a similar feel to that where it's, it's principles for life and work. So as you mentioned, uh, they, they refer to life, they refer to wartime and they come from intense experience, but then they're, they also use those in a business setting. So in that sense, I, I loved the book because I love, I love reading stuff about seals. And so that part was really cool. And then you get this principle that, that comes from it. And then I love business and I, I love reading about how people can solve businesses and how businesses get into a rut and how, you know, simple things sometimes can, can help get them out of the, those ruts. And, and so this book had all of those pieces. And so it, it, in that sense, it was a really cool, cool book, book for me. So, um, Jason, you want to lead us on into, uh, in, initial reactions and, well, there's not much, not much leading for me to do uh, since you already suggested we head to uh, initial reactions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually suggest that we follow that lead and head to initial reactions to the book. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, if you have any, uh, any questions that... Uh, oh, that I'll have, I'll have plenty, the- questions, plenty of questions as we get moving, but uh, let's go cool. ahead and get to cool. your initial reactions to the book, uh, each of you. So uh, let's... Uh, you, you can flip a coin and, uh, and, and, or, you know, fist fight it out or however you want to go for whoever wants to go first, uh, go for it with what your initial reaction to the book is, uh, or was, uh, and, uh, what people can expect when they, when they do read this book. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Uh, so I think initial reaction wise for, for me, it was powerful. I, when I first read it, 
you know, it was the fall of 2015. It was my first football season at Army. I had been working there for a little while. Um, and it was, I was, I was struggling with my job uh, because the guy that originally hired me had left and we brought in a new guy that I didn't really see eye to eye with. We were, I was struggling to connect with him. I was struggling to kind of find my place on the staff. Uh, and a lot of these lessons were immediately applicable to what I was going through. And I was able to see from this book, this is what a leader should be. And this is how you have to run a staff. And this is how you have to impact people. And then I was looking at the guy that was supposed to be doing that to me. And he was falling short on a lot of these categories. And so I was able to say, okay, I'm going to put this in the back of my mind and say, when I get, when I get to the, my next place, I know what to do. And I also know what not to do. Um, so it was a powerful book for me when I first read it. And I think that's why it's impacted me so much and why I still, I mean, I have three copies of it in my house right now <laughs> and I've, and I've given out, I don't know, five or six others in the do last you, few years. Do you years. remember how, like, was it a book that was being read at West Point by a lot of people or do you remember no. how you came about it? So Mike Defran, best friend, co-host of the Good Network, he heard Jocko on Tim Ferriss's podcast. He heard okay. Jocko on Joe Rogan's podcast. He got the book and he said, he said, Mike, you have to read this. And, and at first, you know, I, I was a little skeptical to read it because I, and I love, I'm fascinated by the military. I love it. I always have. And I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical though, to read books written by Navy SEALs, by special ops guys, Count me in in that group as well, because a lot because, of those guys yeah, don't have much so to I, say other than I was in the SEALs. Exactly. So at first I was a little skeptical. I got it and I started reading it and, and it was, I mean, it, it significantly impacted the way the person that I am today, you know, three years later. Uh, but th I mean, that's my initial impression. <laughs> so yeah. I, I got a couple questions actually out yeah. of that. So before we move to Eric here, you mentioned that, you know, you, you were looking through this on this is what leadership looks like. This is where some of the people that I've been under are not meeting the bar, are not living up to that. Uh, and that you said that there were some lessons that you you resolved. These are things I'm going to do differently. These are things that I'm going to take away from this book that I'm going to do when I get into a different situation. Yeah, I want three of those. So what are, say, th the three biggest lessons yeah. that you took away from this book that you resolved upon reading it, this is what I'm going to do differently. What are those, what, what, what say, yeah. if you got three, give me three. So I'll start with the, the title of the book that is extreme ownership. And that's basically the whole, that's the, the main underlying principle of it. And it's that you have to be able to own the things that you do good or bad, that if you succeed in something, okay, you, you know, you can take ownership of it but more so you should take ownership of your failures and you shouldn't pass the blame to other people because that's not going to help you. Eventually, you know, you're going to get caught up in it and it's, it's going to turn out bad. But if there's a problem and you say, Hey, I messed up, this is what I did wrong. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to move forward. You, you've, you've owned it. You've put it behind you and people now respect you more because of it. Yeah. They're um, much more willing to follow somebody who's willing to admit that, 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 that right. when they're wrong. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I was, when I, I started working there when I was 24, 25, you know, it was my first real staff job. And, and you, 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 there's a level of expectation that you don't want to fall below. And so I don't know if I was constantly not taking ownership of things, but I definitely know that there were moments where I would pass the blame to somebody else, or I would try to, you know, skate by and, and not own up to something simply because I didn't understand the concept. Um, but now you know, I've been able to apply it to every single day that I go to work, every single day that I that I have a decision to make, I, I think about extreme ownership. Um, I'd say the next principle is is the idea of, of keeping things simple. Uh, it's one of the laws of combat that he talks about, and it's that complexity doesn't always make things better. That complexity is all, can ultimately lead to the downfall of a, of a mission or of a task or of a job when things go bad and, and there's always going to be problems that arise in any task you're assigned, 
But if you can have a plan and you can keep it simple so that everybody understands what needs to happen, you're more likely to succeed at the end of it. And so, you know, in my everyday life, I work with a lot of undergrad students. I work with a lot of graduate assistants. Um, and, you know, if I have to delegate out a task, I try to water it down to the, the most simple components that there are so that there isn't this confusion so that people don't, you know, skip step B and C just to try to get the D faster. Uh, do you find that that takes more work on your end to try to simplify things for people? What, what, what is that? What does that look like from your end to, to actually implement that? Yeah, I think it does put a little bit more work on me at the, the front end of it, but at the, but then it makes it easier at the back end because I don't have to go through and correct mistakes. You don't have to do as much cleanup. Right. So, and which I, which I'd rather do because then at the end of the day, I can say, Hey, you just did the job and you did it right the first time. So now like, you know, let's build some momentum off of that. Um, because ultimately, you, you know, I'd like to be able to try to set up my people for success and I'd like to, you know, give them a, give them a full deck. Uh, and then I'd say the third concept that I really been able to apply is, uh, and I'm not sure if it's exactly, uh, a law of combat or not, but I know it's talked about is just the idea of, of not having an ego. When I was a, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when I was in my early twenties, I, I was cocky and I, and I thought I was, I thought I was, you know, big man on campus and I was a big fish, small pond and I, had an ego. and it, it followed me around a lot and it definitely, I did well, you know, I, I did good in school. I, I did well at my jobs and all that, but I let it get, go to my head. And I now see that if you're, if you're trying to be somebody that's in a leadership role and you have an ego and you can't admit when you're wrong and you can't take ownership of the things you do wrong and you can't do that because of ego, no one's going to respect you. But if you can be the person to set ego aside and say, Hey, here's what we need to do or here's, or tell me what I can do better you can't do that if you have an ego. And, and that's something that I saw directly when I, as I was reading this book, I had a guy, you know, that was my boss that he had an ego and he couldn't take criticism. And that made my job really hard. And since then I've been able to say, look, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I, I you know, I, I'm fine with it. Make me better. And I think it has. Well, uh, also correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like from that timeline you just gave, the the point in, in when you w in which you lost your ego coincided with the time you were at the University of Florida. Did that experience humble you as well? You know what? It, it I mean, it really did. And so, so there was a there was a brief moment in time uh, where, again, being young, being cocky, thinking you know everything, I got into being a gator being a gator. Um, I definitely was humbled. And there was a point in time where I, where it was like, Hey Mike, you got to get your stuff together or you might not be here much longer. And, and so, yeah, I, I was, um, but I think that's important. I think everybody has to have a moment like that They're in life at some point to realize that I'm not bigger than anything. And then once you, once you can can realize that and conceptualize that, then you can move forward and, and become successful, achieve the things you want to achieve and really make an impact. Well, and, and I liked that part of the book because uh, he talked about the combat situation that came about is, you know, a lot of the movies that we see now about SEALs, uh, especially in, in these most recent conflicts are that the SEALs can kind of do whatever they want. So they've got beards, they've got uh, long hair. They, they're not wearing the uniforms. Uh, they kind of do their own thing because they're, they're so cool. But um, Jocko said that, that his group was like that. But then when they, when they had to start working with other, uh, other groups in the U.S. military that had, uh, that had uh, to where they had to shave every day and, and maintain certain standards, that, uh, that even though Jocko and his group were the SEALs, they took on those standards of everyone else. So they started shaving every day. They, you know, close, close haircuts and all that. Um, and, and, but it translated into a lot of things like another seal group came into theirs who didn't lose the ego and they ended up not being able to work with them because they thought they were so good that they, that they put everyone else at risk. Um, so 
Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. It's fascinating to me to, to hear some of this too, because you know, this is one of those things where, uh, actually I just finished teaching a college class in which, uh, it was actually last week, uh, where we covered some of the, uh, some, some wisdom literature content. So wisdom literature from the ancient world, uh, and some of the particular stuff that we looked at was in the, in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, uh, which a lot of people, you know, are familiar with, but you get all this, it's kind of ancient language and it's, 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 you know, archaic type uh, proverbs in a lot of ways and stuff that people don't really pay much attention to, but there's so much attention paid in Proverbs to several figures. One is the fool. And then another is the, uh, is uh, another person is the proud, the proud person or the the characteristic of pride is the thing you, you want to avoid folly and you want to avoid pride in Proverbs. And one of the, one of the things that I had my students try to do is, identify what are the characteristics of foolishness or folly in this wisdom literature uh, and what are the characteristics of being proud because a lot of times you get people that think oh you know being proud is about you know thinking you're better than other people or you know having a high opinion of yourself or whatever but it's pretty it's pretty interesting that when you start breaking down wisdom literature and you start getting to the bottom of what this harmful thing that they're, that they're calling pride is it's exactly what you were just summarizing that Jocko is getting to the bottom of here. And that is you're getting to this idea. You, you're in real trouble. And this is why you've got that old, the, the, one of the proverbs is uh, pride comes before destruction. It's often misquoted as pride. Pride comes before a fall. It's actually pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But um, Pride comes before destruction because the thing that distinguishes pride, the characteristic that they're talking about with this word that's that, 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 you know, this pride thing is not about thinking that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm good at what I do or whatever you might be. It's about getting to the place where you're not teachable and where you're not accountable and where you no longer are willing to hear from hear from the outside or be corrected. And when you stop being teachable, when you stop being correctable, then yeah, you're going to run into serious trouble and eventually you're going to run, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to have, have issues. And that's why, again, pride goes before destruction. That's why humility is the thing that comes before success because a humble person recognizes like the humble person actually goes, yeah, okay, I need some help on this or, you know, I can still get better at this. I might be the best person in the world at it, right? LeBron James is always working on his game. Because he recognizes I can still get better at this. He's still calling in somebody to, to, you know, to help him improve this aspect or that aspect. When you stop doing that, you end up in trouble. When you stop being able to admit that you've got uh, that you that you got something wrong or that you that you can improve something or that something needs to improve, you're in serious trouble. And so is your organization. And it's interesting to hear that the way the way that you put it, because that summarizes. I mean, this is this is wisdom that goes back thousands of years. I mean, multiple thousands of years. I mean, you can find the same kinds of wisdom going back in, you know, ancient Egypt in, you know, 2500 BCE. But it's something that every every generation we need to hear it and we need to put it into practice because it's it's hard to put your ego in check, especially when you actually start getting good at something. When you are good at something, then it's then you're in real danger because. You, you might not be as easily correctable. And that's when you end up having those, the, 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 that that's one of the reasons why success is so hard to sustain. You can get successful, but sustaining success is way harder than actually getting success in the first place. So to me, that's, that's interesting to hear those lessons in particular come up in, in what you got from the book. Yes, sir. I mean, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's simple. I mean, it's simple, you know, it really is. And it's simple because it's been around for so long. Yeah. And, and that's why it's been around for so long because it's, that's how, that's how you have to live life. If you want to be able to achieve the things you've set out to achieve. Yeah. It's simple, but it's not always easy. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's exactly. the exact thing Jocko says in the book. He said, he, he, he's talking about it in, in the sense of leadership. He said, leadership is simple, but it's hard. Yeah, that's right. Because it requires it requires humility, and nothing's worse for us than to, to than to have to make ourselves little. <laughs> right, and that's another concept that he talks a lot about, and I'm sure it may get brought up, but we'll just talk about it right now. Is that you have to do what's hard, and you have to do it first. And so <laughs> yep. there's a lot of things in life, you know, whether it's just waking up or it's 
it's washing the dishes or it's making your bed or it's, you know, these tiny little things that are hard. But if you push them off and push them off and push them off, it's never going to get done and you're always going to ha- not feel accomplished. But if you can just do that hard thing first and make your bed and do 25 push ups and then get your day going, you've already accomplished two things that not many other people have. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's and, that's straight up Jocko right there. I mean, if you follow Jocko on Twitter or Instagram, <laughs> every single morning he's got a photo of his his watch because he wakes up at 430. And so his watch will usually say 432. So I, must take him a couple of minutes to get out of the bed and, and into the basement where he's got his, uh, his gym set up, but he, he gets right into working oh, out. Yeah. And, uh, so they call it the four thirty club. And, in and, and in the book, he, he says the alarm is the first real test of the day and it sets the tone for the rest of the day. <laughs> and he sets three alarms. He sets one that is plugged in one that is battery powered and one that you, uh, you, um, chart, like you, you, wind up uh, a wind up one so he's got three alarms every single day um and he usually wakes up by the first one but but you'll see on instagram it'll be like 440 and he's like uh uh, first alarm didn't work second one did i'm up and and one of one of his his most famous sayings is uh two is one and one is none so if you just have one alarm set that's none yeah that's that's an interesting interesting way to think about it it's redundancy Build redundancy. Yeah. And that's actually an, another interesting lesson. I mean, obviously, I'm the one person in this discussion who hasn't read this book yet. Uh, but um, uh, the thing, one of the things that's interesting to me about that, about the idea of redundancy, and this is something that's come across in, this, in some of the stuff that I've heard Jocko talk about, is also making allowances for our weaknesses and making provision for that, like knowing that... so. It, if you think that you're going to be strong and you're going to be able to resist and do everything the right way, just because you're awesome, then (laughs) you're going to, you're going to run into problems as soon as reality kicks in and your, you know, the flaws that we all have come into play. The really, the wise person sets up redundancies to account for the weakness for, for, for personal weaknesses to say, you know what, realistically, I know that this is how I'm probably going to respond here. So I'm going to remove that possibility. (laughs) I'm going to take, I'm going to put something into place so that I, so that that's not even, not even something I can do. And now I I have to do the thing that's, that that's hard, that's right or whatever, and it's going to work. So again, that's something building those redundancies in to recognize your own weakness and, and plan for weakness. That's, Again, that's it's simple, but it's really smart, and it's really it's really not what the norm is not the norm. It's what the norm should be. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Eric, any uh, let's let's flip the let's flip the discussion over to you. Uh, your initial re- reactions to this book? Uh, anything beyond what we just heard? No, I, and I, I, I kind of covered it before. Just I, I, I love reading about seals. I love reading about business. And so this was the combination of the two. The one thing that I guess that, that was uh, just initial reactions that it, it seemed weird and, and especially kind of Jason, what you were saying about your your skepticism of, of, of seal books. I mean, they, they, these guys are the real deal and all that, but it, it was just weird. Like they, they went way out of their way not to mention any compromising detail at all. So like the the only person's name I can remember reading is Chris Kyle. Like he's the only other person they talk about in all of their discussion about businesses. Like you never find out the business they're working with. Um, they even say that they change titles and stuff to, so that you wouldn't even be able to guess. Um, so it was kind of, it was weird in that sense. It was, it was just kind of like you felt part of the story, but then it was like, Oh, and then the commander did this. And then, uh, so and so did this, but it, there was like never any names. So it was, it was just kind of it, it stuck out to me. You know, it didn't didn't necessarily take away from the book, but it just I, it, it stuck out. It was initial in an, an initial reaction and and um, just, just kind of odd, I guess. But <laughs> I, I understand I understand that that you have to for for uh, sensitivity issues. So. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move then into favorite quotes. And uh, Mike, since I since you went first on the last one, we'll go ahead and Eric, you go ahead and start with a couple of your favorite quotes here. And we'll go back and forth with a few of your favorite quotes from this book or favorite. You can do quote or specific lesson if there, if you don't have a quote dialed up. Uh, okay. let's, let's let's go through a few favorite quotes or favorite lessons uh, from this book. OK. 
and I'm going to, I've just got one from the book and then I've got a couple that are kind of his, he's done on Twitter or something, but they, they tie into some of the principles in the book. So basically you're saying you're going to cheat. I'm cheating. Okay. But, um, and I'm also going to Jason, see if you can finish off. It's like a Georgia thing, huh? This quote, (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to see if you can finish off this quote. It's not what you preach. It's what you. I'm guessing it would be, it's what you practice, but. And and normally that's what, what you hear, but he says, and, and this is really in the sense of a leadership position. It's not what you preach. It's what you tolerate. Oh yeah, I've heard him. I've actually heard him say that. I should have been. I should have been able to finish that. I've heard him say that more than once, actually. Yeah, and that's I, true for coaching as well. That's something I, I as a as a um, as both a university instructor and a coach. Uh, that's something I've found to be absolutely the case. It's not what you teach; it's what you tolerate, and that's why, for example, my students. One of the things that I will get marked down on. Uh, I'm about to have uh, uh, student evaluations come in. Uh, they'll be going up tomorrow and I'll see them in about two weeks. Uh, one of the things that I will get dinged on that, that my students will complain about is I have regular quizzes. I have co- constant assignments. Why? Cause I've been there. I know they ain't going to do anything unless I require it. If I don't tolerate them not doing it, they're not going to do it. Oh. So if I, if I to- or let me put that in, again, if I tolerate them not doing it, they're not going to do it. And same thing with my, with my wide receivers this last year, they learned first game that I graded away from the ball just as hard as I graded to the ball. And when they had to do five up downs for 30 loafs on, on, a, on, on not blocking on the backside of a play, they learned very quickly for the next week that every play I'm going to be graded and I'd better be, I'd better be finding somebody. <laughs> That's right. I, 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 and I was really thinking of that one uh, in, in terms of child raising and, and um, you know, your kids are obviously looking at what you're doing, but uh, and probably not listening a whole lot to what you're saying, but the key there is, is what you tolerate and, and the things you let slide and you think the things that you let them get away with. Uh, so whether it's in parenting or, or a business setting, um, that, that kind of sets the standard. And, and if you tolerate things, people are going to take advantage of that. And so I, I thought that was just kind of a brilliant play on words because you yeah. always hear it's not what you preach, it's what you practice. But here he says, it's not what you, it's, it's not what you preach. It's what you tolerate. And I, 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 I loved that. I, and he, he also really extends good. that to, to the, to the individual's practice as well, though. You know, that the nice thing about what he does there is that what you tolerate also has to do with what you tolerate in yourself and of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you let stuff slide with yourself, then the people you're leading are going to notice, even if you don't tolerate it from them, if you tolerate it from yourself, then eventually they'll, they'll rebel. Yeah. And that's especially true with kids. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so Mike, uh, you, you have a quote. Yeah. Um, a good leader has nothing to prove, but everything to prove. <laughs> so what's the, what's the gist there? What's he getting at? You know, you, you have to, if you're, if you're going to be in a leadership position, you can't do it trying to prove to the people around you, the people that you're leading, how good you are. Um, but you have to prove to them that you respect them, that you trust them, that you're going to allow them to do the job that you've assigned them. And then you also have to prove that you're going to take care of them and do what's right by them. And so it's a, it's a nice little caveat to, to being a leader that I think a lot of times can get left. They can get pushed aside or forgotten because there's probably a lot of people out there that once they reach that, whatever that position is, they want to say, Hey, everybody, I'm, I'm bigger than, than this whole operation. And, and I'm going to prove it to you this way, this way, and this way, because I drive a really nice car or because I have a really nice watch or because I pay for the really nice dinner when like, that's not what matters. What matters is how you treat your people. Outstanding. Yeah, and, um, what, what I like about that too, and he talks about it a lot in the book is the dichotomy. I mean, this, this right. is a dichotomy. And then Mike, before our call, you were saying that uh, these two guys have a, another book coming out. What's, what's the title of that one again? 
Yeah, so Jocko and Leif are writing a book that's, I mean, it's probably written by now. It's going to be coming out in the fall, and it's called The Dichotomy of Leadership. So I would imagine, you know, the last few, the last chapter, the last few pages of Extreme Ownership talks a lot about the dichotomy of leadership. Uh, and so I just imagine that that book is really going to dive into that concept a, a lot more. And that's yeah. really my biggest, that's one of my favorite pieces of the book is that whole concept of the dichotomy of leadership. Yeah. Yeah, right. that was cool. Next, uh, next, uh, next quote from you, Eric. So, um, this goes back to simplicity and, and Mike, you, you, uh, you brought up that chapter. I, I loved that chapter too. I, I actually have seven principles written out on my website for my, uh, my, uh, web development company and simplicity is one of those things. And, um, Jason, as you pointed out, it, it's often, oftentimes a lot harder to, to make things simple than, than complex. And so it's this is always this, harder uh, to make things simple than complex, unless you're just screwing it up. Yeah. And so <laughs> take a hammer to it and make it simple, I guess. <laughs> follow Jocko on, on Twitter. He, he just has a lot of, he, he always asks people to ask him questions. So if he's, if he's got an hour layover at an airport, he's like, all right, questions for an hour. And so people just ask him, you know, these long questions and he, he usually answers with one or two words. And so this, this was one of my favorite ones that he, that he just did. And it, and it ties in with the simplicity concept. So somebody asks him, what exercise should I do to improve my pull-ups? Pull-ups? And his pull-ups. response was pull-ups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's that's I would have said. Yeah, pull-ups, uh, dude. <laughs> yep. So that's my, sometimes yeah. it's just that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my next... <laughs> Is uh, a no bad team, only bad leaders. And in the book, he gives the example of when he was running uh, SEAL training in California. You know, everybody's seen on TV. You go to Buds, there's Hell Week, and you're not sleeping, and you're in the water, and you're one of the things they have to do is they have, they're they're in boat team, boat crews. There's like six guys to a crew. One person's assigned to be the leader, and they oftentimes have to carry that boat over their head for miles at a time. They have to take it out into the surf and flip it and flip it back over. And, and so in the book, I don't know what it was. Boat crew number two was doing really, really well. Boat crew number six was doing really, really poorly. Uh, and he switched the leaders and immediately the results changed. The team that used to be really bad became really good. And the team that was really good became really bad simply because of that one person. And I think, it, I think it's really important in life that if you're in a leadership role, you have to recognize that like maybe the issues that we're having, maybe the reason why we're not successful, maybe the reason why we haven't been able to hit our marks this quarter, maybe it's not the people that I have, maybe it's me. <laughs> and and Mike, Mike, can you read that quote one more time? It actually cut out for me. Can you, can you read it one yeah. more time? There's no bad teams only bad leaders. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. All right. My next one again is another Twitter one. Um, but, uh, kind of goes along with, uh, with Jocko's mindset. Someone asked him, what is your favorite fruit? And he replied, steak, steak. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And I just saw a recent one where he did a 72 hour fast and he said, what's the best, what's the best way to uh, get back into eating uh, after a, a 72 hour fa- fast? Eat. And it's just a photo. It's a photo of a steak that he's got at a, at a restaurant. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, have a 72 ounce steak after a 72 hour fast, maybe. Yeah. So it's Mike, so many- any, any more? I, I've got one one other idea, kind of to talk about along with with the quote section here. But uh, any, any other quotes? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say one more of the dichotomies of leadership, and it's able to exercise extreme ownership while exercising decentralized command. Oof. Uh, you know, I think, and that's something we haven't really talked about yet. Is you know another big concept in the book is this idea of decentralized command, where if you're the leader, you're gonna you're going to explain to your people why we want to do something and then let them do it. And you're not going to micromanage them. And you're going to have to, you know, you're going to trust that these people are, are going to do the job that you expect them to do because you've laid out why it needs to be done. Um, and so this, this 
dichotomy of leadership, being able to exercise extreme ownership while also exercising decentralized command is, I think it's really important. You know, you need to be able to, to take ownership of the things that you do poorly more so than the things you do well, but also you can't micromanage the people around you to get there. Yeah. Yeah, I really, uh, along the extreme ownership, that's that's the very first chapter, the very first principle. He said the, le- the leader must own everything in his or her world. And, and this principle comes right after a story of a blue on blue. And a blue on blue is where uh, friendlies, uh, a friendly is killed. So in this case, uh, an, an Iraqi soldier that was uh, part of the American, American crew was shot by someone uh, I think it, by an American sh- soldier by, mi- by mistake. And, and so it's called a blue on blue. And as the Lieutenant commander, Jocko was in charge of that group, but he, he didn't kill the guy. Like he, he's not the one that shot him, but um, there, there were a number of things that went wrong. And, and so they would do like a postpartum after the, after each mission and, and discuss debrief, it. Debrief. Yeah. Debrief. Yeah. Um, kind of what we saw in the, uh, Creativity Inc. book, too, where, where they would do that after after each film. Uh, but they would do that. And, and uh, so he, Jocko started off the meeting. He goes, whose fault was this? And, and one guy says, it's my fault. I'm the guy that pulled the trigger. An, another guy said, no, it's my fault. I, I, uh, I should have been over here and wasn't over here. And then another guy said, no, it's my fault. And, and Jocko said, no, it's my fault. I'm, I'm the leader. And, and that's kind of what, where this idea of extreme ownership, like he, he was, if, if somebody did something wrong, he didn't explain it to him, to him. Well, it, he, he took ownership of that. And in the very next meeting was with the higher ups who since, since, uh, since the soldier was killed from, from their side, they had to, they had to do a, a bigger meeting for that with, with the higher ups. And in most of these meetings, you know, the, uh, there's blame to go around. It was this person's fault. And Jocko walked in and he said, he said, gentlemen, this is my fault. And he said, it just, it just shut the room up. And, um, it actually, you know, led to, to a uh, greater understanding and, and, uh, that the problem didn't happen again. And, hmm. and so that I thought it was really, really neat. Um, in, in, in the story that, that led up to the, that principle of extreme ownership. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, one of the things that actually taught me about this when I was growing up was actually watching my dad work as an official. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that, that really stood out about my dad that was different from a lot of other officials is, uh, and, and I'll never forget this particular story. Um, my dad had a good reputation as a, as a very good official, but um, you know, every official is going to miss, miss calls periodically. And, uh, and the thing that, that one of the things that distinguished him is that uh, and like I said, there's one individual story that I still remember. It's a coach that was just climbing all over him for missing a call and, you know, yelling at him, whatever. And my dad <laughs> was right over by him and he said, coach, I missed it. <laughs> That's it. And he Done. said, the coach just stopped. He's like, what? He's like, coach, I blew it. I blew the call. Missed it. You're right. <laughs> yep. And the coach is just like, well, Okay then, <laughs> and that ended completely. Ended the confrontation, and <laughs> basically that was that was that. And the thing was, those coaches earned or he earned the respect of the coaches because then, when at a later time, if the coach is climbing on him, he said, Co- "You know, coach, no, I got it right." That coach knows, like, listen, if he if he if he thinks he if there's any chance that he thinks he missed it, he's going to tell me, right? <laughs> and suddenly you have the respect of those coaches and suddenly they're not climbing on you quite the same way, which is counterintuitive and you don't see a lot of guys do it that way, but it's amazing what happens when you, when you willingly take ownership, when you do screw up and when you acknowledge that people often will make a little bit of allowance for, well, you know, at least you recognize it. Okay. Well, don't do it again. (laughs) There you go. And you know, and you know why an official is a really good example for, for this concept it's because, you know, an official has got to, they, they've got to run the field. They've got to manage the whole game. And so a lot of times they are guys that have an ego. And so it's probably not that common to see a guy that's an official that's willing to say, Hey, 
that was on me. Yep. Missed it. Because Sorry. they don't want to. Yeah. Because, because it, it's too much about them. Yep. And the, the official who's not willing to admit that ultimately is not going to be as good an official. Yeah. And that, that official is oftentimes going to be the one that's going to be able to get swayed by coaches and so on. So yeah, that's one, that's one where I learned that very early watching that. It was like, you know, that, that kind of works. <laughs> and if he can yep. do this, then that's a good way to live. And uh, so, you know, kudos to, uh, to my dad for setting that example early on. But actually listening to what you were just saying about Jocko actually reminds me very much of the same thing. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Do, do either of you have anything more in this section that you want to want to get to? No. All right. No. Well, let's go ahead and get to uh, some final details. Any any major details or key lessons, sort of nitty gritty of the book that you want to get to before we get to conclusions. So any real details that you want to get to? Um, so another thing that, that hasn't been brought up yet is the idea of being able to lead up and down the chain of command. And so... Obviously, as we talk about this, you know, a lot of the examples of, of somebody that's in a leadership role is somebody that's got the title, somebody that's name is on the door, somebody that hires people, that makes big time decisions. But what's often left out is that anybody can be a leader. You can be a leader of yourself and you can be a leader of the people around you just by doing things the right way, but leading by example. And in the book, he talks a lot about how, you know, a junior person in this, in a SEAL team can lead up the chain of command. And it's, and it's not by going to your boss or your, and saying, what do you need me to do? It's by being the person that's got enough foresight in what we're trying to accomplish to go to your boss and say, Hey, this is what I think we should do. And this is how we should do it. And this is what I want to do to make it happen and present this plan. And, and that's how, and then that person can say, yeah, let's, let's do it. That's a great idea. Let's roll. And, and that's a way to lead up the chain of command when you're somebody that's, that's not technically in a leadership role, but you want to make an impact and you, and you know, you're invested enough in the project that you want to make a difference. And you're not going to wait for somebody to, to tell you how to do it. You're going to say, this is what I think, how I think it should be done. And then maybe there's going to be a tweak here, a tweak there. But if you're a person that's willing to take that step, you're going to take that criticism and then you'll be able to roll with it and, and make a difference. One of the interesting things about that is how that interacts with the necessity of humility for the people up the chain. So if you're going to if you're going to be able to lead up, then the people above you need to be able need to be the kind of people who are going to be leadable or going right. to be humble enough to be good leaders, meaning that they're going to get get information from the people below them. They're going to make their decisions on the basis of, you know, people, the people who are out. This is something that my wife learned at, at one point when she was uh, doing sales for a very large company is the people up at the top often don't know the details that the people at the bottom know that if they just knew those details, they'd make different decisions. Right. But if you can't, if you're not willing to call those people in or to let those people walk in and tell you the details of, listen, this is what's actually happening. Like, I know that this is the battle plan, but that's not where they are now. <laughs> right. If exactly. you're not willing to listen to that, then it, that's going to p completely screw that up and the person can't lead up. But then on the flip side, the only way to become a leader is actually to lead up when you're not actually in a position of leadership. So the whole thing actually reinforces if that top leadership allows it to happen, then you're developing leadership below you because that's those right. people can do all that. So it's, it's, it's one of those recursive things. It's really a, a phenomenal, phenomenal thing when you actually see it work. Right. And man, it gets broken if it doesn't. That's... <laughs> You're, you're couldn't be more right. Um, and it's something that, that I think a lot of people aren't, aren't really aware of, you know, like in, in the job that I do every day, I have, a, I have a, a distinct boss and I've got distinct people above me and I've got distinct, I've got people that are below me. And I think if I were to say, Hey, like, what are you going to do to, to be a leader today? A lot of people are going to just say, oh, I'm just going to do what that person tells me to do. And it's, and then you, you kind of float this idea to them like, well, how about instead of that, you do this 
And then you can sometimes see a light bulb turn on. Sometimes you don't. Uh, but it's, I mean, that's the approach that I've taken being one year into a new job at a new place where, you know, I want to make an impact and, and I can tell that it, that it has, I've been able to do that because of how I've approached the position. Yep. And I've been able to say like, this is what, this is what I think we should do. And this is how I think we should do it. And then yep. my boss just says, go get it. Yeah. And, and to me, the, the, the way to think about that is like wins above replacement thinking in terms of, of your, of, of, of the job that you're in. Right. So if you think about this, like as an athlete, you've got that stat wins above replacement. It's a, you know, a metric that, that often works in, in football or basketball or whatever, or baseball actually yeah. you get, you can do it much more easily because how, how granular baseball stats are, but you, you know, you can, you can be the replacement level player. Like you do your job, you go out there and you do what's required of you, or you can choose to be the, the guy that's going to bring so many more wins above replacement because you're actually, you're, you're, you're bringing more to the table than what your bosses are just telling you to do. Right. And that part is the part like that thinking again. And that, and the thing is that's going to get you, that's going to, that's going to be the thing that's going to get you elevated. Right. You know, so long as you do that again with humility and that you're willing to be led and to do that, you don't forsake the things that you're actually supposed to do in your position. Right. Right. So, you know, that, that part of it is, is really, uh, is, is really critical. Eric, any, anything, anything else here? Yeah. Just one thing I wanted to highlight. Um, and, and this is in the chapter about planning and the importance of, of planning. Uh, there's a quote, the plan must mitigate identified risks where possible. Seals are, are known for taking significant risk, but in reality, seals calculate risk very cal- carefully. And this was a lesson that, uh, that my entrepreneurship professor taught. And, and he gave, he would always give the example of, you know, a lot of people in in the way that entrepreneurs are are portrayed in the media is that entrepreneurs are just these crazy people taking insane risks, like, and they're hoping it pays off. But a true entrepreneur is, is one who they've mitigated the risk down to the level where it, it almost makes, it's almost riskier not to do it than, than to do it. Um, and, and so I, I loved this section here where, where he's talking about that, like SEALs, they plan, they plan the mission so well that it's, it's not as the movies portray it, like they're, they're just these guys doing these crazy missions all the time. Like they have thought through every scenario, uh, the leadership at, and up and down the chain, uh, as you just mentioned, Mike is, is all in tune, like every, everything is considered and it has to be, and there has to be the discipline in place because your enemy is not going to be following these, these, uh, what your plan is. So you've got to have all those things set and mitigate risk down to, to the bare minimum to where once, once you go out and do, do your thing that, uh, it's not as risky as it may seem to, to everyone else. And I think that's just a good, a good overall lesson. I mean, a lot of people talk about quitting their current job to, to go and, and start a new company, but, what if what if you kept your current job but just maybe did it on the side a little bit? So you're not taking this crazy jump, but you're mitigating risk. You still have other income coming in, and then and then you can do the other thing. And you just think about that in, in different parts of life where things don't necessarily have to be as risky as as we make them if if we can plan plan correctly. And I thought that chapter did a great job of of talking about that. All right. Well, uh, any other any other real details to get into before we get to final final conclusions here? Anything else to clean up here? Anything else that you just had a burning passion to want to talk about in this book? Any details? No, I mean just uh, what the we, we've sort of discussed it, but the la- the last principle is discipline equals freedom, and that's what you always hear uh, uh, Jocko talk about. And, um, and it's so true. Yeah. Yeah, and he he gives some great examples, and 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 obviously the main one being waking up at, at four thirty, and where that came from is, is really interesting. And I didn't I didn't know that this before reading this book, but when he got into the seals, he he saw his schedule, and every hour of the day was accounted for. So I, I would I would assume with the four thirty time that he wakes up, I'm I'm assuming everything started at at uh, five o'clock in the morning, and it went till ten or twelve at night to where there there was no extra time. So his way of, of moving up, of, of having time to read, of having time to, 
to get things uh, cleaned, you know, wh- whether it's a weapon to get to get everything in, in place was that extra 30 minutes by waking up at 430. So you're going to see that every day on his his Instagram. But it's it's kind of a neat story behind that. And it all goes back to the discipline of, of, of waking up and, and ha- having that discipline go through every part of the day. And if there is a countercultural, if there is a more countercultural message than that, there there aren't very many of them. <laughs> because we very much are a culture these days of trying to trying to eliminate any boundaries in life, any mm-hmm. sort of discipline or, you know, well, you know, I feel like I, you know, I, I want this. This is what I naturally want. You know, be true to yourself. Right. Do, do what do what you do. What feels right to you at the moment. Well, you know, when the uh, whole the whole the whole climax of life is to be retired Oh yeah, like yeah. That's what that's what everyone's working for. Yeah, so work so like that you don't have to work and, anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's again the whole the whole thing is all about eliminating eliminating the the boundaries and the the rules of life so that you know you can you can truly be free. But the thing is, it's only once you actually have boundaries that that are clearly defined that you can really have freedom within the boundaries that are set. And and that that message is one that I really appreciate from from Jocko. And of course that is his most recent book is, is titled, uh, that. So, you know, we, we could, we'll probably end up discussing that at some point in the future. You got something there, Mike, I'm, I'm seeing you. Um, uh, I just want to, so, so yeah, I wanted to add to, to the discipline equals freedom thing, uh, that if you have the discipline to do what's hard now, you'll have the freedom to do what you want later. Yeah, that's the truth. But the thing is, the discipline still carries over. You're still going to be disciplined and you'll have the freedom to be awesome. Exactly. (laughs) So, all right, let's go ahead and get to the final, final word. Let's get to our conclusions on this book. Who should read this book? So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and kick it over to you first, Mike. Uh, What uh, what are your conclusions about this book? What 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 are your closing thoughts you want to leave people with? Yeah. So my closing thoughts were going to be discipline equals freedom. Um but we just talked about it. Um, but I mean, this is a book that, that anyone can read. And it's a book that I think everyone should read. I've gifted it in the last two years to, I mean, more people than I can think of. I've bought this book more, more times than I've ever bought any other book. And I have in my house right now, three copies I've given it to my boss. I've given it to my head basketball coach. I've given it to friends. I've given it to my, some of my student athletes. Um, I mean, it's a book that anyone can read. And it's a book that if you're someone that wants to achieve the things you've set out to achieve, this is the template to do it. And it's powerful. Well, there you go. Eric, anything, uh, anything you want to leave with in terms of final, final word, final conclusions here? Well, Jason, for for not having read the book yourself, I think you 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 really nailed it with the the con- countercultural aspect of the book, and and we've talked about this a lot with other books of Titans books. Um, the things that really stick out in these books are not the ones that that you you often hear or are the the common sense type of of. Uh, of information, but but the ones that are that are a little con- countercultural or, or um, uh, as as we've talked about, that there's a dichotomy in the, in the the information, and I think this book has a lot of that. Uh, I mean, even the one that I highlighted of it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. Uh, you, you expect that to be practiced, but instead it's tolerate. And, and when you think about it, it just makes so much sense. I mean, you let one sl- one thing slide, and then that leads to a lot of other things sliding. Uh, so many, so many, just good, simple lessons. There, are, you know, we talked about the principles book by Ray Dalio, where he's got hundreds and hundreds of principles in, in the book. This one is thirteen principles, and some of them are one word principles. So they're easy to to think about. They're easy to remember. Um, and and yeah, the setup setup's really cool with uh, a military application, a principle, and a business application. So. It, it applies to a lot of different areas of your life and, and different things you can think of while, while reading about the principles being applied in, in this book. So yeah, it's, I'd say it's a good one. Um, I, I've enjoyed following Jocko on, on different platforms and, and uh, seeing his kind of no nonsense approach. And, and so I'm glad I finally got to uh, 
to to the book of his. So, yeah, I, I, it's one that I would I would suggest. I think it's a good uh, good good leadership book. All right, that's going to do it for us here today. Now, before we get any further, I really want to thank Mike Chavone. Thank you for coming on this podcast. It's been a great discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been really cool. I'm I've enjoyed being on the other side of the interview, so to speak. And <laughs> and uh, I mean, I think what you guys are doing is awesome. And this is a book that I could talk about for days. So I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Once again, we really appreciate it. It's a tr- been a terrific discussion. And for those of you out there who've not subscribed to Mike's podcast, once again, that podcast is the Good Network. You're gonna want to subscribe to that for more discussion like this one. And once again, if you are not a subscriber to this podcast, you can subscribe to us through any podcast manager of your choice. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please leave us feedback. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram at Brooks Books of Titans, and also leave five star reviews at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts helps us out a ton. We'll be back again next week to do Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. On behalf of Eric Rostad and this time Mike Chavone, I'm Jason Staples. This has been the Books of Titans podcast. Thanks for listening. Keep listening, keep reading, and keep improving. And keep thinking. Get after it. I made this.